Results tonight have been phenomenal, and we are getting ready. I mean, literally, we were just all set to get outside and just celebrate something that was so beautiful, so good. As far as I'm concerned, we already have. We won with the majority of the American people. And every indication is that the majority will grow. We have a popular vote lead of nearly 3 million votes. Welcome to CNA Insight. This is a special edition of the program where we will analyze the results of the U.S. presidential election 2020 and to discuss the impact on Asia. I'm Genevieve Wu and I'm very privileged to be joined today by my guests, Tina Data, chairperson of the Republican Overseas Singapore, Simon Baptist, chief economist at the Economist Intelligence Unit, Professor Joseph Liao, Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at NTU. And last but not least, Stephen Oaken, Senior Advisor at McLarty Associates, and he formerly served in the Clinton administration. Thank you for joining me, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this, is a, this special edition is meant to be a results analysis show, but we find ourselves to be in a bit of a pickle because we don't have clear results at this point. And this is... I'm going to say fairly unusual. The last time we had this was 20 years ago in 2000, Bush versus Gore. But we are in uncertain and complex times. And there are a few interesting factors this time that is going to take more time to reveal the eventual winner. So we're going to take a look at what are these factors. But first, a reaction to the inconclusive outcome. Or was this a surprise? Is this expected? Joseph, you want to kick it off? Well, um, I think a lot of people did actually uh, predict or expect um, a, a close fight. Uh, uh, obviously, um, at, the, at the two polls, there would be people who, who uh, expected some kind of landslide. But by and large, I think uh, there was the sense that um, it would very much be um, a replay of what we saw in 2016, with the exception being the key battleground states. Mm. And indeed, that is what we are waiting for now to okay. see uh, whether they, they turn, as it were, as far as uh, the, the Biden camp is uh, concerned, mm -hmm. or if uh, Trump can retain the, the support that he has uh, in some of these key states. Mm -hmm. Simon, what do you think? So for me, the surprise is that Trump is as competitive as he is. Um, he has done better than was expected based on the polling. A factor in this election, though, is the huge numbers of postal and pre-poll yeah. votes that have happened. Yeah. So the amount of pre-election uh, voting that was done, it's equivalent to about three quarters of the total vote from 2016. Mm. In many states, including these key Midwest battlegrounds, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, mm. those votes are counted more slowly. So I think it's, it's too early until we see the end of those postal ballots. It's a knife edge now. I'd rather be Biden 
than Trump. All right, Tina, how do you feel at this uh, unexpected weight, I suppose? Well, one of the things, as you mentioned, um, I'm not too surprised with regards to the weight, but what I will say is I am very happy with the amount of turnout in the United States and how many people did true, come out yeah. to participate in the democratic process. Right. Um, how we got there um, is not really important, but the fact that we had so many people come out to want to participate, mm -hmm. I'm very grateful as an American that we've woken up and want to do that. And um, I'm not surprised at this point, it's gonna take us a little longer to make sure our votes are counted correctly. All right, Steve, well, how do you feel? Look, this is completely expected. We're voting in the midst of a pandemic, the yeah. worst pandemic in the history of the United States. Uh -huh. More than 220,000 people have died. There are thousands, you know, almost a thousand people dying a day in the United States. So what that meant was that people had to find a different way to vote. And so they voted by mail. And that has never happened in these numbers. And the other thing you haven't seen is the turnout. The turnout is like the highest in 100 years, and it's the most people who voted ever. And that is because there is a lot of intensity on both sides. Now, when it comes to the election, you have to remember, we don't have one national election. We have 51 different elections. And in three of the states that have over 5 million ballots by mail. Quickly, I want to talk a little bit about the opinion polls before into the poll. And uh, it was very much favorable uh, uh, to, to Biden. And uh, even early results now, as we stand, seems to favor Biden. Is there a, but what are the chances of Trump uh, defying the odds and being the comeback kid? Two things to keep in mind. The first thing to keep in mind is that Joe Biden will win a majority of the popular vote. And this will be the first time in history that in seven of the last elections, the Democrats have won the popular vote six times. The second thing that's happened in this election is that the Republicans have filed lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit to keep people from voting. Mm -hmm. They have tried to keep people from voting in Texas to make it more difficult um, to do early voting. They have tried to make it more difficult to have ballots accepted by mail. They have tried to limit the time that ballots can come in by mail. In addressing that, if you wouldn't mind, in addressing that, part of the issue that we have is that laws in the United States to correct what Steve is talking about are done by the Congress. And so while these laws stay on the books, if there's really this big of an issue, we need to talk to our congressmen to address it, create new laws, and put new laws on the books to remove these challenges that can be put in place state by state by state. And it it's not an easy fix, is my point. We are a democracy, and so while pe some people like it, some people don't, but the Congress has to change the laws. We can't just say we don't like the laws and get mad because people use those laws. What about the problem of unrest? and violence on the streets. We've already had uh, reports that people are, uh, there's an increase in gun sales, people have boarded up shops, uh, streets have gone silent. Is there a real possibility of that happening while we wait? It, it feels unlikely. I mean, election day went ahead pretty smoothly. Uh, I think you know, more smoothly than uh, was expected. Um, so I think US has got pretty strong institutions. Whichever side wins, the other side, of course, is going to contest the vote. Um, there'll be some things through the courts. We might see some protests, as we saw after Trump's victory last time. But I mean, the U U.S. does have a protest culture, um, and you know, the, the country and the institutions are set up to be resilient to that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect to see civil unrest. If we have a situation where there is no peaceful transfer, where all the votes don't get counted, um, and somebody prematurely uh, says that, that they have won, then that could lead to some some protests, and then we don't know where we're going to end up. So let's hope we don't get there. Let's hope all sides respect the norms that we have in the United States, and that we will have the situation where the either President Trump will get inaugurated or Joe Biden will get inaugurated in January without any incidents between now and then. Uh, hypothetically speaking, uh, President Trump's reaction, can he declare a victory unilaterally? And if he does, what happens? He can declare anything he wants. Okay. He can tweet anything that he wants. It's meaningless, right? It is the, the power is within the states. The power is within the 50 states to decide, based on who their citizens voted for, which electors they send to the Electoral College. Now, will Donald Trump say, stop counting the votes in Pennsylvania? Or I'm not going to respect any vote counted in Pennsylvania after election night, even though under state law they're allowed to be counted for the next three days? I mean, he may say that. And then you have to ask yourself, will anyone act on that? So yeah. what he says is, is irrelevant. It's, it's whether people act on it that is going to matter. But that is the yeah, risky they, dynamic yes. for, for, for the result, because there is a pattern with the late counting of votes. Mm. So uh, 
um, Democrats were more likely than Republicans to vote early by mail. Right. So, and in these key Midwest states, those votes are being counted later. So it is to be expected that Biden's vote tally will increase by more than Trump's as the counting goes on. So the, so the Republicans definitely have an incentive to try and stop that voting process earlier, which is why we've already seen a lot of, uh, a lot of lawsuits coming in. Okay, Joseph? I think, well, um, fact of the matter is uh, both candidates can, of course, uh, declare whatever they yes, want, but uh, indeed <laughs> it is quite irrelevant. We shouldn't forget that there is actually a process. We shouldn't forget Thank that, you. right? Um, mm -hmm. They will choose the electors, the electors will choose at the, at the, the college, uh, and then in early January, Congress has to sign off uh, on, on the choice. So there is actually a process um, that is has been proven to be a fairly robust process. All right, on that note, uh, we'll take a short break. Uh, we'll look, as we look forward to a new administration, be it a Joe Biden administration or a second term for Donald Trump uh, come January 20th, a lot can still happen in the next three months. We still have a COVID-19 pandemic to tackle and an economic recession to fix. And it does look like with the drawn out process of the vote counting, um, that we're looking at lawsuits and counter lawsuits, uh, pretty long road ahead, perhaps, and maybe even a constitutional crisis. But more on that later. When we come back, we'll take a look at the legacy of Trump and what uh, that means for Asia. Be right back. No, I'm not thinking about concession speech or acceptance speech yet. Uh, hopefully, we'll be only doing one of those two. And you know, uh, winning is easy. Losing is never easy. Not for me, it's not. Welcome back. You're watching a special edition of Insight, where we analyze the results of the U.S. presidential election 2020. Polls have closed and a vote count is still underway. At this point, we want to take a look at the last four years under the Trump administration, the hits and misses, and in short, the legacy of Donald Trump. I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Now, Tina, you're Republican, but I'd like you to list some of the not-so-good things that the administration has done, and I'm going to throw over mm -hmm. to Steve, and you're going to tell me some of the hits that um, the administration have, has achieved. Let's start with you. I think that the administration hasn't done quite a good job explaining to the American people regarding health care. Um, I think that removing the individual mandate was something that was a promise is made, promise is kept to, a, to his constituents, but I don't think that it gave security to the foundation of the rest of the American uh, population. And so you can see that, I think, with the, as the candidates were running for election, um, you know, the Biden campaign was able to use health care as an issue. I know that the administration itself wants to put a together a comprehensive health plan to support the Americans. You know, we have 180 million people that have health care through their jobs. So the Americans do, that do not have access to health care, President Trump could have done a better job um, explaining uh, the next steps outside of the, you know, the Obamacare plan. Steve, what do you think? Something good that has come out of the Trump administration? Oh, it, directionally, there are some things that Donald Trump did from a foreign policy perspective that, that were in the right direction. China needed to be confronted more on its unfair trade practices. It, it needed to be confronted on what it has done when it comes to forced technology transfers, when it comes to cyber theft, when it comes to not protecting uh, companies' intellectual property rights. Um, there are other multilateral institutions where the burden was not shared appropriately. NATO was an example of that, where, where more countries needed to put in um, towards defense of themselves to bolster NATO. So you, you know, the WTO needs to be reformed um, so that you don't have the unfair practices that you get from a country like China, um, because they shouldn't be a non-market economy, and they shouldn't be given those, those privileges uh, anymore. Now, he, he took it way too far, and he took it in the wrong direction by taking a unilateral approach mm -hmm. instead of a multilateral approach, and only confronting on those issues instead of working cooperatively. But directionally, um, Donald Trump was correct, and, and a Biden administration, if there was one, is going to keep some of that, especially when it comes to China, when it comes to confronting them when they need to be confronted. Good. We'll talk a little bit about U.S.-China relationship in a little bit, but uh, Joseph, hits and misses of the Trump administration. 
Well, um, I think the Trump administration, as far as its policy towards Asia is concerned, uh, is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I think on the security side of the ledger, I think um, uh, some progress was made. And in fact, um, what he did or what his administration did was to initiate a, a number of processes which I think a lot of regional states um, quietly uh, supported and agreed with. Um, on the so, so the court, for example, okay. uh, is one, um, and that is likely, regardless of whether it's a Trump or Biden administration, the court is probably going to continue and gather pace. Um, as far as um, economic policy is concerned, um, I think he he him calling out the the, the, the Chinese and uh, on on the issues that Steve mentioned, um, I think was was uh, hit the nail uh, on the head. Um, I'm not a big fan of how he then went about, or the administration went about trying to address those issues. Uh, case in point, I am pretty, I still am pretty convinced that um, if the TPP had remained in place, that would have actually been a very effective platform mm. for him to to effect some of the some of the pressure uh, on China that uh, the US is now doing unilaterally. And uh, I'm not sure that it's gaining all that much uh, traction as, as we are want to believe. Um, yeah, so, so there's a, there are a number of things that I think um, he, he, the administration started, which really should continue. Sure. Simon, your take. I mean, the clear achievement of the Trump administration has been in corporate tax reform. So um, the reforms around the treatment of uh, cash held overseas by US companies, that was a very good reform. Um, you can uh, debate whether the corporate tax rate should have come down or not, but if you believe in lower taxes, which the Republican Party do, then you know, Trump made a significant change there and got that through uh, Congress early on in his term. So that's, I think, is his biggest, uh, his biggest achievement. Okay. The biggest, um, I think, negative impact the administration has had is that American society is probably more divided yeah. than, it has, uh, than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. America appears to me now deeply divided under Mr. Donald Trump's administration. Now, was this something that happened before him? Did he add f uh, uh, fuel to the fire? What, what happened there? Why does it feel so much more splintered, Steve? I mean, look, we've been going in that direction. We're becoming hyper-partisan for a number of issues. Some of it is social media. Some of it is, is gerrymandering, where you get very conservative Republicans or very liberal Democrats, and, and the middle starts to disappear. So you start to see those things. But Donald Trump has used all of that hyper-partisanship to drive a wedge between the country. You have never, ever heard a president say, well, that's a Democrat-run city. Right? You would never hear Joe Biden say, well, I'm not going to help that state with COVID because it's a Republican-led governor. Right? Donald Trump plays tribal politics, and that is making the situation that we have much worse. And, and there's nothing that shows that more than the, politi the politicization of wearing a mask. Right? It, it is having very serious health consequences in the United States. It's having very serious economic consequences that you have a president who is using the hyper-partisanship not to tone it down, but to make it worse. Tina, do you think that's a fair assessment? Actually, I look at the situation differently because we can say, he can say it's hyper-partisanship and I can also say it's statement of fact. So when you talk in the United States where riots have been taking place, They've been taking place in democratic-run cities. When you talk about where sanctuary cities were taking place in the United States, those are democratic cities. So it's, it, yes, no one would be want to say, well, it's a democratic city or a democratic state, but fact being told, the cities that have these problems, Chicago, Baltimore, Portland, Seattle, um, I could go on and on. They're democratic cities. So the fact that the, the words are being used, yes, that, ra that raises up the, the, the presidential level of calling out, but there's still a statement of fact. He's not stating something that isn't true. He's just stating it in a much more louder way than we have heard before. But it's undeniable that the protest on the streets uh, has, has risen so much more. And we were talking about Charlottesville in the early days and uh, Black Lives Matter. It just seems to be a little bit more uh, intense uh, these couple of years. Joseph, can you wait? Well, as a neutral observer uh, with no dog in the, in the fight, um, I would say this, that um, ideally we would like to see a president or a presidential candidate for that matter who can at least uh, rise above this, you know, and not be embroiled 
or even take advantage of um, whatever sentiments are brewing on the ground. If there's one person, I would imagine if there's one person in the country who should be able to rise above it, it should be the president. Um, whether or not that is the case now, whether or not um, that uh, will be the case uh, after the elections, um, I think uh, it, it's going to be challenging because of the, the the way the situation has indeed been uh, polarized, and absolutely, it's not something that uh, just happened overnight. You know, it's been brewing. It's been it's been brewing for a while. Okay, I want to talk about um, Trump's signature America First policy. Now, has that worked for America? Has America become stronger in the last four years? Well, I think for the American people, people in the beginning, I think America started to feel pride. Um, thinking about America first. And you could see that where not only Republicans and Democrats both take, decided to take out TPP, which to be fair, I sat on the TPP committee in Asia and I personally was in support of TPP. But Americans really did feel that message that President Trump had to put America first. They felt it. They understood it. They wanted to feel that they were going to be first. So has it worked? I think that um, there are many Americans that do feel uh, the president has fought for them, um, fighting for them with China, fighting for them, you know, like I said, in NATO, fighting for them in many different ways to make America not be paying for, uh, as he would per se, paying for the world, to focus back on what's important for the United States. And I believe that, that many Americans feel that that's what he's done. Stephen, is that true? The Democrats, are they behind that platform of America first? Okay, wait. Donald Trump is a populist, okay? And when you say America first, that is just a populist message to your base. Every administration right, wants America to do the best it can. Every administration wants America to be strongest. And every other administration up to this one, as you can go post-World post War II, for Democratic or Republican said, how do you make America the best? You make America the best through alliances. You make America the best by building up other countries so that you can then manage those who you compete with. How do you do this? You do this through NATO. You do this through the WHO. You do this through climate change. You do it by coming together and, and, and fostering the Iran nuclear deal. Now, when, when Donald Trump says America first, he's withdrawing America from all of those multilateral institutions that have enabled the United States to be the superpower that it at least was, if not still is, and can be again, right? And, and so that is what he has been attacking. And so I don't, you, you would certainly see a Biden administration would come in and say, okay, how do we work together with our allies instead of attacking them? And that is why this election was so critical in the United States, even though it was about COVID for the most part and Donald Trump's failure in handling it, it was also about whether or not we were going to elect a populist for a second term. Okay, speaking of COVID, of course, that is the big issue here. Would his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic be a mark of his legacy? And what does that mean, Joseph? You know, thinking about this, the COVID situation is very interesting because uh, on the one hand, um, it will be a mark in the sense of the, the handling or mishandling of the, of the situation. Um, but on the other hand, I think that um, him being afflicted by uh, COVID and recovering within a few days actually worked, uh, believe it or not, uh, in his favour, you know, because it's almost a, a superhero effect <laughs> that uh, he triumphed over uh, COVID. And, and I would really think that, um, I mean, obviously not everyone, but <laughs> certain segments of the American uh, uh, electorate were captivated by that, uh, that yeah. fact, you know, that our president uh, stared COVID in the face and stared it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, we'll take a short break here. When we come back, while the U.S needs to heal after a bruising and rather polarizing election. Let's hope that the US still has its eye on things happening beyond its borders, especially in its relationship with Asia and in particular China. We'll talk about that when we come back. We choose. We choose hope over fear. We choose unity over division. We choose science over fiction. And yeah, we choose truth over lies, constant lies. 
Thanks for staying with Insight and this special edition on the result analysis of the presidential, U.S. presidential election 2020. Now, in the last four years, the Democrats and Republicans uh, in the U.S. have pretty much deferred on almost every issue under the sun, except for one, the U.S. perspective on China as a strategic rival. Um, regardless of who's going to be in the White House next year, U.S.-China relations look set to be choppy for a while. Now, in a nutshell, can you describe the U.S.-China relationship for me in the past four years? It's become a lot more confrontational uh, and uh, bifurcation between the U.S. and China is certainly reality in sectors such as tech, even if there are some examples like finance where there's ongoing integration. But the relationship has become much more overtly confrontational. And I think this is one of the biggest geopolitical trends, certainly for Asia uh, and probably globally over the next 10 to 15 years. And it has some potentially large consequences for uh, business and technology and innovation. Right. Joe? Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, across the board, it's been uh, competition, a uh, ramped up uh, mm -hmm. competition. Um, whatever um, off ramps that uh, used to exist, um, by and large, have been closed down. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we shouldn't forget that uh, there was always that that element of competition in previous administrations as well. Right. But um, there were there was uh, there were more opportunities and avenues to sort of uh, manage it. And those, to me, the most alarming thing is those avenues um, don't really exist uh, today. Hmm. Okay. Now, what about the Republican and the, Dem the Democrats' uh, approach towards uh, the, the China issue? Steve, how would a, a Democratic, the, the Democrat Party do differently? Well, I mean, the, the difference would be unilateral versus multilateral, but the, okay. but the issues are the same. And, and let's, you know, go back to the bifurcation, right? We've had bifurcation with China for qu quite some time. Mm -hmm. How come you can't use WhatsApp in China, but you can use WeChat in the United States? How come Chinese companies can use the cloud in the United States, but foreign companies can't use the cloud in China. There is very little reciprocity in certainly certain sectors, and that is not new. That didn't start with, with Trump and his tariffs. That started with China and, and how it walled off certain elements mm -hmm. of, of its business. So you are going to see a focus on reciprocity, be it a Democratic administration or a Republican administration going forward. You are gonna see more of a focus on human rights possibly more in a, in a Democratic administration, but you'll see it with both a Republican and Democratic administration. You will see it in, in Hong Kong, and you'll see it in Xinjiang, and you'll see it where there are going to be more forced labor provisions going in um, for sanctions and for tariffs. So directionally, the United States is moving in that direction. Where you, you'll see a difference in, 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 in the two is that just because you confront China where they need to be confronted doesn't mean you can't also cooperate with them. Yes. You can cooperate with China when it's in your national interest to do so, such as on climate change, such as on pandemics, and, and not only solving COVID, but, but preventing future ones. Tina, would you like to weigh in? A Republican or Democrat strategy towards China? What are the differences? What are the similarities? I don't believe there's going to be much of a change um, in the engagement uh, from a Trump administration to China. I think that they've gotten to a tier one sort of understanding, even through all the, the additional tariffs, surviving the farm exchanges and all of these things. And my guess would be as long as the administration stays the same, as long as those trade representatives that are within the administration stay the same the next four years, you will have had that credibility beat up with their cohorts in China to be able to continue and push and continue those type of conversations. I think that there's still more that China can give, and I think there's things that we can give. And I think that if China sees Trump win, they're going to know they're going to have to take another deep breath and come to the table with something else because they're going to have four more years of the same administration. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we may stall a little bit um, if we have a new administration because they'll know it's a new ball game. And as we all know, uh, the negotiators under the Trump administration were very tough. Now, one of the hallmarks of the Trump administration uh, is tariffs. That seems to be uh, his tool. But Biden has also said that uh, he's not uh, against using tariffs as well. So another four years, whether a Biden or Trump administration still using tariffs, what would that mean for us? There's a fairly uh, widespread anti-trade sentiment in the US right now. Um, so if Biden wins, I don't see him reversing uh, the tariffs that China has, that, sorry, that Trump has put on China. Um, of course, if Trump comes in, he won't vest them either. He may well, he may well extend them. So that 
that anti-trade posture is still certainly there. I think for China, the um, a Biden victory would be short-term uh, beneficial, but long-term more difficult on the assumption that Biden would be more successful in building a stronger, uh, stronger multilateral alliance. Mm -hmm. Joe? Um, I think that uh, in the event of a, a Biden victory, if he, if he wins, um, it's not going to be a case where tariffs are going to be lifted. Um, so I certainly agree. I think whether or not uh, over time tariffs will be listed, uh, lifted, uh, either uh, in the case of a, a Democrat or Republican administration, actually depends on China. You know, and how China responds mm -hmm. in terms of its own uh, economic reforms. Mm -hmm. And here is where I'm a bit concerned uh, that we are careening down uh, some serious bifurcation because mm -hmm. if you look at how uh, China has responded, it's basically dug in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. It's gotten more uh, nationalistic. It's gotten uh, uh, very much paying a lot of attention and devoting a lot of resources to developing certain sectors of their own economy. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, in the long run, I think, um, doesn't, doesn't lend to a, a, a very uh, a nice pic picture for us uh, yeah. in the region. But we will have to deal with it. Yeah. Right. China's strategy is to... Um, try and avoid outright conflict for now um, and prepare as quickly as they can to become independent of the US as much as possible in areas like business and technology. Mm. So they're playing a stall and they're then trying to stall um, a hardening of the international landscape while putting a lot of domestic resources into, um, into substituting for, for critical US inputs like semiconductors. Okay. Yeah, but you, you gotta remember, why are the tariffs there? Right? The tariffs are there because China has, has and continues to engage in unfair trade practices, has industrial policies such as Made in China 2025, um, where they want to use their domestic power um, to command the 21st century industries that should be open to competition. Now, what Donald Trump has not been able to do in four years is to be to, to use those tariffs to get China to change those unfair trade practices. Mm -hmm. So what a Biden administration presumably would do was you, you keep those tariffs on to get China to change its behavior and then start to negotiate off of those things. Donald Trump is mistakenly focused on the trade deficit mm -hmm. and he's focused on agriculture purchases. Right? Agriculture purchases are not what is going to be driving the competition between the US and China in the 21st century. It, it's going to be green technologies. It's going to be AI. It's going to be, you know, you know, electric vehicle batteries and, and the like. Yes. All right, speaking of multilateralism, in the event of a Joe Biden victory, and it looks like he would move more towards this direction of multilateralism, what does that, uh, how does that impact ASEAN? a move towards multilateralism, that kind of pressures or expectations? Joe? Well, I think ASEAN has uh, reason to be a little bit concerned. Um, and, the, and the reason why I say that is because um, it is going to very much depend, obviously, on what the multilateral effort is directed at. Okay. Yeah. So, hypothetically, if a Biden administration decides that we want to deal with the China uh, challenge uh, multilaterally, involving not just uh, the Europeans, um, who would generally be, be um, more willing and ready to come on board, um, not just involving the Europeans, but involving the ASEAN states as well. Uh, ASEAN has to ask itself some tough questions. You know? um, and uh, I think that um, you are looking at a situation in ASEAN where on the one hand, there is, uh, I believe there is some semblance of a convergence of a strategic outlook in the sense that uh, all ASEAN states, um, uh, you know, with, with, without exception, want to avoid being caught in this uh, uh, superpower uh, rivalry. But the, the, the question is, what are they going to do about it? Mm. And are they going to address these concerns um, unilaterally mm -hmm. uh, as uh, individual uh, sovereign states, or are they going to do it uh, as ASEAN? And uh, we know doing it as ASEAN, you know, ASEAN centrality and the like, um, that's herding cats. Right, it's mm -hmm. it's it, it's a it's a laborious, uh, thankless task to to rehash centrality over and over again, and that's the reality that that ASEAN faces. The ASEAN uh, region is right in the centre of this U.S.-China rivalry. Mm. Every country would like to not choose, 
Um, but what they're finding is that both China and the US is forcing a choice yeah. on more and more countries. And we've seen this accelerate actually through and probably because of the COVID-19 situation. Right. Um, so there's going to be more pressures in Southeast Asia. Countries here are going to have to face in ways they will find uncomfortable yeah. um, the, the choices between the US and China. There are some silver linings, though, I think particularly around supply chains, where ASEAN is actually well-placed to benefit from relocation of supply chains, both from China and from the US, as both sides seek to, uh, to pursue a diversification strategy. OK. Uh, but if you think about foreign policy. There's three elements to it, right? You've, you've got the diplomatic, you've got the defense, and you've got the development. And the Trump administration has basically gone unilateral on the diplomatic uh, in the development. The defense you know, is still more or less no different. You still have the military to military cooperation uh, within the region. Diplomatically, the Trump administration does not trust multilateral institutions. You see that with the Paris Climate Accords, you see it with WHO, you see it with WTO, you see it with NATO, you see it with, with the president not bothering to show up at any ASEAN meetings or even sending his, his, the vice president or senior cabinet uh, to some of them. And you, you basically have development ignored you know, altogether. So what you will see, I think, under a Biden administration is that you will bring multilateralism to back to diplomacy. You will bring multilateralism back to development, and that will be a benefit to the region. And, and, and so that is a shift that you can see happening while it is still going to be very difficult to balance the US-China competition. Um, and you know, that's a question, can ASEAN stay together or is ASEAN starting to split apart um, country by country when it comes to trying to balance? But ASEAN would be better uh, unified in terms of, of, of achieving that balance as well. Okay. Great. Hold that thought there. Clearly, the U.S.-China China dynamic is one of the most critical issues that will dominate U.S. foreign policy, regardless of who is in the White House. Now, we'll take a break. When we come back, winds of change blowing down the corridors of the White House. Let's take a look at what the next four years might hold for Asia. Welcome back to this special edition of Insight. Now, looking ahead to the next four years, the world will need to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as to pick up the pieces of a global economy that's right now in pieces. Um, let's do here a short retrospective of, the, of Trump's policies. What are some of his top policies that have benefited Asia in the last four years? The biggest impact that Trump's had on Asia in the last few years has been the US-China trade war. And some countries have benefited from that and some countries have suffered from that. So okay. there's not, there's not a uni universal positive or universal negative. Okay. We could say Vietnam, for example, has been a, a, a big beneficiary, mm -hmm. um, firstly of rising wages in China, uh, also the increasing desire from US firms to have a China plus one strategy. Uh, and then also it's benefited particularly in um, garments, textiles, electronics, um, as the, the tariffs of the US has put has made Chinese production less competitive for export. So mm -hmm. Vietnam, an example of a, of a big winner. Mm. Tina. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, his focus on attention to India, um, creating a stronger uh, both military uh, relationship with India as well as a commercial exchange, uh, bringing India into what would be the South Asian area, letting them know that they are going to have a bit of a responsibility with the quad that's been put together, um, getting them involved with that to help um, control uh, China's out outreach into the South China Sea. Mm. Okay, Stephen. Trump has no Asia trade policy. Hmm. Explain. Doesn't have an Asia trade. I don't know how much, how much we have to explain. I mean, there, there's, there's unilateral policies towards different countries. Mm -hmm. There has been no strategy whatsoever for how the United States is going to fit as a Pacific nation with other Asia Pacific nations in, in, in either some type of liberalizing trade agreement, in some type of multilateral framework. It doesn't exist. So it, there is no Asia trade policy that the Trump administration. What about has. the South China Sea? They have been a bit more definitive. In it's not an Asia trade. Policy. No, I'm no, just I talking mean, about. Oh, well, yeah, again, policies, I mean, yeah. military. The, the military has, sure. has 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 its engagements. Yes. Um, but you don't have anything when it comes to trade. You don't have anything that the United States is trying to do to tie the region together so that you can 
increase trade with those who respect a, a global trading system and to put pressure on others to get them to meet those demands. Right. And that has not happened. No. So my question was, what policies of Trump has benefit Asia? So you say nothing, zero for trade. What about military then? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, if you were to talk military, you could certainly say that we're worse off today as a world between where North Korea is. North Korea has increased its nuclear arsenal. North Korea has presumably larger you know, ICBMs. There is no uh, framework of countries working together to get North Korea to change um, their behaviors. So I think North Korea is, has, has gotten worse in the last four years mm -hmm. um, as opposed to getting better. Um, you know, like, as I said earlier, um, the fact that China um, has, you know, a, there is now a strategy for how you confront China um, and, and how you work national security into, into trade, um, there are positive elements of that. But there is no overarching framework to Asia that the Trump administration has ever articulated when it comes to economics and trade. Now, if I could just narrow cast this, and it's strictly just for Asia's needs, right? What kind of U.S. leader will Asia look to or need to ensure security and prosperity? It depends which country you are coming from. So from the perspective of China, uh, they would prefer a US leader that was less effective at, uh, at maintaining strong bilateral relationships. Um, if you're some of the traditional US allies in this region, like Singapore, like Japan, uh, like Australia, um, you're going to prefer a US leader that places more uh, emphasis on multilateralism. Mm. Because compared to China, of course, famously, you know, other countries in this region are all very small. Um, and so it's only through a multilateral approach that small countries like Singapore um, can, uh, can have a route to greater influence in, in a geopolitical and military sense. Sure. Steve. You, you can't look at it in isolation because you have to ask yourself at the same time, what leader do you have in Beijing? What is it that China's policies are undertaking? You know, and, and everything that's happening in the region is not just because of what Donald Trump is doing. It, it, it's what President Xi in China are you right. doing. And, and you see tensions, you know, with China um, in India. You see tensions with China in the South China Sea. You, you see the national security law in Hong Kong. You see the changing rhetoric um, from in, in Beijing towards Taiwan. And so when you look at all that, that is going to have, the, the, the calculus is going to be for those countries in the region, well, it doesn't matter in a way who the president in Washington is because the president in Beijing is much closer to us. So, so you have both of those dynamics happening. And until you, you can know what direction is China going to go mm. in their engagement, is China going to open up more to the region? Is China going to help in getting out of the pandemic? Is China you know, going to go forward with, with RCEP, you know, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and try to string together a trade agreement that excludes, by, by choice, the, the United States. That is going to have as much an impact on what happens in the region as to what policies either a President Trump or a President mm -hmm. Biden would do starting in January 2021. Sure. Tina, you want to weigh in? Um, I don't disagree with the fact that, yes, you'd want to take into consideration who the president of China is at the time. Uh, but one thing I'd like to say is that what we've seen over the last um, tenure for President Xi is that his original first four years of his uh, presidency premiership, he was very aggressive. And he was more aggressive than anyone that was a president of the United States and or in Asia would have necessarily perceived him to be. Mm -hmm. The no-fly zones, the oil derricks popping up, the islands popping up, uh, aggression with, uh, the, uh, with the Philippines. There was a number of things that took place. So, but now he's not doing that. My point is, is he's not exactly outwardly as aggressive as he was when he began. So it's very hard to say what type of president you want in the United States when you don't have a stable sort of leader in China because they're changing their, the way that they want to outbound or inbound their um, aggressive tendencies stepping out. So what I would say as an American president, and if I was living in Asia, which I do, I'm a permanent resident, lived in Singapore for over 10 years, I want a strong American president. I want a Asian countries to feel that that president in the United States is loyal, is provided loyalty to the countries, that they know that the United States will stand with them, that understands these challenges that will be faced by um, China's, um, China's 
encroachment and outbound reach from their countries. After the last four years of a Trump administration, Joseph, what do you think? The next four years, Asia looking to the next four years, looking towards U.S. leadership, what would we hope to expect? I think uh, I'll, I'll say two things. The first is certainly from the perspective of Southeast Asia, we would uh, really like a U.S. president who would pay attention to the region. Um, and, uh, you know, so you, you think back to the Obama administration, I think, uh, especially in the, the, the first term, um, a lot of uh, effort was put into that, and that was, that was welcomed uh, in Southeast Asia. Mm. The second thing is, uh, with regards to China, um, I think the main thing there, uh, as far as the, the region, certainly Southeast Asia is concerned, um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. Yeah? Uh, in the sense that um, whatever the concerns about China, um, it is still a major driver of economic growth, um, infrastructure, etc. Um, in Southeast Asia, and no Southeast Asian country is going to um, uh, shut out uh, uh, China, or do they want to be shut out by China? Yeah. Um, so, striking that balance between um, continuing that uh, competitive uh, rivalry in the hope of effecting some change, but at the same time not pushing it to the extent where, where regional growth and prosperity is uh, compromised. I think uh, that is something that would be very much desired in our region. Okay, so some final words then as we, uh, as we draw to a close. Perhaps a last word from each of you on probably what's the best balancing act for Asia as we look towards a new leader uh, in the US and what is your hope of best outcome for all of us? Simon? Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll end up with a clear election result in the US, um, that all the ballots uh, will be counted. Mm -hmm. um, and I also hope that uh, Asian countries, I mean, ha continue to hold their futures in their own hands. I think mm -hmm. domestic policy here is also very important. And the last few years in the US, I think, has shown that um, the smaller Asian countries probably do need to step up uh, a little bit more and uh, take more responsibility for regional security. I would echo what you had to say. I think that um, Asian countries are going to have done a good job, and also they've they're in a position now where they can um, take care of themselves and also add more to their economies, add more work with their neighbors. And whether there are existing trade agreements or not, the initiative was there originally, and I think that there were are ongoing discussions to get trade agreements to raise those levels of engagements. And so I think that it that over the next couple of years, there will be steps and stones that people will be able to start raising their economies up to the, you know, and work together. Stephen, then, a best balancing act for Asia, a best outcome for all? Look, the greatest threat to our planet is climate change. Okay. You need a president who believes in climate change, mm -hmm. who believes in the science of climate change, who then takes a multilateral approach working with the company, countries in Asia to address climate change uh, in a way that works within this world, right, this part of the world, and brings in everybody, the US, China, Southeast Asia, Australia, Japan, Korea, everybody. That's what we need from our next president because all of this other stuff doesn't really matter unless we address the existential threat we face as a planet, and we have not done that for the last four years. All right. Joseph, your final words? Um, well, the region, I think, is acutely aware of the fact that whoever comes uh, into, into power um, uh, in January, uh, on January 20th, um, the, the, challenge, the domestic challenges are going to be huge. Yeah? Um, but having said that, uh, I think the region also hopes that uh, the United States, uh, as it goes about dealing with those challenges, will have bandwidth uh, for the region. Um, not for altruistic reasons, but because American interests very much are anchored in our region uh, as well. And uh, the US has a vested interest uh, in the region, and that has to be uh, hopefully factored into the equation uh, over the next four years. OK, thank you very much for joining me today. This has been a great discussion, and that's all the time we have. Thank you. Whether it would be Biden or Trump in the White House in January 20th next year, can we expect to see a changed America? And how will Asia fit into this new chapter of a U.S. narrative? Will the next president take a new strategy to usher in a more stable international system? 
and define a new global order that will bring prosperity not only to the U.S., but to the rest of the world. This has been a special edition of Insight. Thanks for watching.